um, let's get to some scratch programming. So let's see what else uh, we can talk about. And let me get uh, um, get over to Chrome. There we go. All right, so uh, let's see what we were working on last time. Um, so last time we had our um, silly little uh, uh, clone thing to illustrate uh, clones in uh, also local variables, right? So the uh, ball speed is a local variable, and each ball gets its own independent copy uh, of that variable. So uh, this is how, <coughs> excuse me, this is how you make each ball move at some random speed. So, you know, if you were making, uh, I think we, we talked about, like, let's say you were making a tower defense game or something then you would handle your enemies probably as being clones and each clone would have its own health points or something like that. And then uh, there'd be some sort of logic that when it gets shot to uh, deduct health points, but it would only deduct health points from the appropriate, um, from the appropriate version of the clone. If you don't make this a local variable, meaning it's a for all sprites variable, then uh, what would happen is all, the, in this case, all the balls would move exactly the same speed. And um, that is, you know, maybe what you want, but in this case, uh, we wanted them to be at different speeds and different colors and stuff. So, um, right. Um, okay, so uh, what else could we add? Um, The what now? What DVD thing? I'm not. Uh huh. Oh. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um. I don't watch a whole lot of movies, so or uh, well, on discs. How quaint. Optical storage media, yes. Yes, okay, and that, um, sort of. So, um, this is what I tried to do with the uh, COVID simulator. So, in fact, let's go over to that code and see kind of how I tackled that problem. Um, Okay, so what I did was, um, okay, so I've got a blue ball, okay, and this is sort of the, the master um, object. So what happens is at the very beginning of the program, it's going to um, spawn basically 50 copies of itself and then, and be hidden, okay? So the original or sort of the master ball is never actually visible and never actually moving around. Only its clones are. That was kind of, that's actually what we did in the, uh, the thing I just uh, moved on or got rid of, but we okay, gentlemen? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Are they big balls? Medium balls. Does but my program has the biggest balls of them all. Right? You guys know the song, right? Okay, just making sure. All right. So anyway, uh <laughs> yeah, we can all be twelve years old every now and then, right? It's okay. Um so um we've got the an original ball teleports itself all over the um the thing, and in this case, I made it so that uh, 
it could only ever go to a random position that had uh, the x coordinate less than 175, and that's because of where I put the red line. Okay, but if I didn't have that, then that wouldn't have mattered. So then the meat of the code for all of these dudes is what happens when uh, we have a clone. Uh, the other thing I did is I made it in this particular uh, simulation that you start with precisely one infected ball. Okay, because I wanted to simulate, you know, what would happen if you only had one infected person to, to start. Okay, so the infected person is, uh, there's no clones of it, um, but it can turn another thing to be infected. Okay, um, all right, so the meat of the code here then is with the blue ball. So the pink ball, what does it do? It basically bounces around, okay, and if it hits the... Um, Here's how I did the bouncing, okay? Um, this was kind of janky, but it sort of worked. Okay, if I really wanted to do this correctly, how would, uh, if two balls run into each other, how should they collide and then, and then bounce away? Right, okay, and they should do so according to some physics right, that uh, the momentum coming in should be the momentum going out, and you treat it as an inelastic collision, and the, uh, the um, let's say that the two balls come in with opposite velocities, then how should they bounce off? Well, they should, but it'd be like this. Okay, they just collided. How should they bounce? Like that, right? Because basically the momentum gets transferred between them and bam, they go back the other way. Um, but what about if they come at like an angle like this? Well, you guys have played pool, right? So you, so you know what I'm trying to talk about here, right? You've got a ball, you've got your cue ball, you hit it. If you hit it straight on, what happens to the target ball? It goes straight the same direction that you, you know, hit it with your, with your uh, cue. Yeah, stick. Your, your cue. There we go. Okay. Um, and if not, if it's at some, like, an angle or if the other ball happens to be moving, although that doesn't really happen in pool all that often, for your first, uh, for your shot, it might when things bounce around, uh, then, you know, they behave according to physics. So there was no way to do that in, in Scratch. And the reason is there's no way that I can access um, the local variable of another sprite. Okay. So what I would need to do is if I had two balls that were colliding, I would have to say, okay, let's say it's ball A and ball B collide, right? Ball A's new velocity would depend on ball B's old velocity. And there's no way to get that information. Um, I mean, the only way I could think to do it would be to make a giant list that contained all of the velocities, but it would be super, super janky. Okay. Um, and this is just a limitation of scratch, not a limitation of object-oriented programming. Um, so what I did instead was that under what conditions would I need a bounce? Well, I would need a bounce if a ball is touching some other object. And what, what I can do in Scratch pretty easily is, is pull, am I touching something that has color blah? Okay. So what I did was I made the balls all solid colors so that it would be easy to tell whether or not you were um, uh, touching a particular color. Um, and then I said, okay, well, the color code that I used was Blue was susceptible, pink was infected, the sort of yellow color was um, recovered, I think, um, and then if somebody died, then they just got deleted, so I didn't have to worry about that. Uh, and then the big red line uh, that was going to simulate my like quarantine zone, uh, obviously it's red, right? So in the situation that you touch any one of those things, 
Uh, and I, I guess I didn't really need to do this with the red one because the red one's in a fixed position and it has no velocity, right? Um, then, so if you touch one of the other balls, then I change the ball direction by 180 degrees plus some random amount. Okay, now it was kind of janky as you guys saw, so let's just run it and you can see kind of the issue. Okay, so like right here, for example, what's happening or what was happening? Hmm? Uh, purple means infected. Uh, blue means susceptible and gold means recovered, but it doesn't look like I actually ever added that in. They just went back to being blue. Um, oh yeah. Okay. So I'm sorry. I, I must've, uh, not finished coding something. So you see the infected ones, there are no infected, but there's a lot of pink ones. So those should have turned gold when they recovered to indicate that they were no longer infectious. Um, okay. But for, for now, don't worry about that. Uh, what do you notice that the, the collision, sometimes they wig out and start like tangling up. So basically what was happening there is because I was using a random number, um, two things happen with Scratch, right? The two balls do not get to detect whether or not they're touching another ball simultaneously. One of them, ha one of those detections happens before the other. Okay. So what could happen is I could do collide. One ball says, hey, I just collided. I should turn and it turns, but the other ball hasn't detected that it collided, so it keeps going and runs into it again, and then this whole process repeats, and that's why you were getting kind of the janky collision action going on. Um, it was, you know, kind of the best I could do um, in Scratch because I can't access uh, what another sprite's local variable is uh, to do the physics computations and do it correctly. Same thing happens along the red line. Uh, although in the red line case, I could have fixed it. Okay. Um, so let's actually go to, oh, I never actually added this. Oh, that's the problem. Or no, maybe it's here I added it. Hmm. You know, I don't remember what I did. Um, I've messed it up. So um, the intent was that you would get infected if you touch somebody that was, actually, you know what? I think I have it backwards. Sorry. Pink was recovered. Gold was infectious. And then this one, um, I should have made pink or gold. Sorry. I think that's what I had meant. Let's run it. Oh, he died. Yeah, that sometimes happened. He he just immediately dies. Yeah, he is dying kind of quickly. There we go. Okay. So, yeah, my bad. Gold was uh, infectious and pink was recovered. I, I had them backwards. And the, uh, the, the reason that the infected ball right now is pink is because he eventually recovered. Right. But if I had restarted the program, it goes back to being gold because he starts as infected. So, um, yeah, that's, that's my, uh, my bad. Um, okay. Yeah, so um, the, the bouncing thing, right, there is somewhat of a limitation here because of the physics. Uh, 
Now, if you had like, if you only had like, say, two or three objects, or like, let's say you were making a pool game, right? Well, it wouldn't be the end of the world to have a global variable for each of the balls. So you could call it like, I mean, since they all have names, right? You could have, you know, one ball speed X, one ball speed Y, two ball speed X, two ball speed Y, etc. cetera. Um, because there are only, uh, what's the highest, how many balls are in pool other than the cue ball? 15? Yeah, that makes sense because it's the fifth triangular number. Yeah, okay. Yeah, 15, right? Because uh, you got 5 plus 4 plus 3 plus 2 plus 1 when you stack them in the in the triangle, right? So, um, okay. So there you would really only have 16 objects to keep track of, the cue ball plus the 15 other guys. Uh, and so there it would be a little janky to do it, but you could. Right, it's only 16 pairs of variables to keep up with, or maybe uh, 16 triples if you want to include speed in there. Um, but for something like this, where it was a randomized and I had 50 of them and I wanted them to do a bunch of random stuff, like that's not going to be practical. Uh, so yeah, um, yeah, there are some limitations to the language. Um, sorry, right? I mean, this thing was designed to teach children the fundamentals, basics of programming in kind of a fun way, right? We shouldn't be too shocked that it's not Unreal Engine 4. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, so what else could, uh, what other questions, I guess, do you guys have? The, uh, the animation's coming along okay? Kind of makes sense how that works, right? Use some messaging uh, to get, Keep everything timed correctly. The fade trick that we talked about on Wednesday is kind of handy. Um, what else? You know, make it look cool. Make it not look like crap. Be creative, right? Do something fun. That's that's it. Um, okay. Well, so let's uh, let's actually transition a little bit here. Um, let me stop this, um, and let me make sure that I've got, um, Minecraft, and make sure the stream is going correctly. Ooh, let's join the beta. <laughs> Um, all right, let me quit that and let's see what's all, uh, what's all in here. Notebook style coding interface. Hey, that's good. Library updates, code builder changes, URL allow list, blah, blah, blah. How do I join the beta? Beta downloads, uh, Mac OS. Huh? I hope it does. Because if it does, like, we're freaking golden. If not, I'm still going to be sad. So, Friday last week, uh, Owen and I spent uh, two or three hours sitting in my office doing a hackathon, trying to figure out what were the limitations of uh, the programming within Minecraft and what, what could we do, what couldn't we do. Um, so let's see what they got. And those of you who are at home, I just realized I didn't have the chat open, so I, uh, if you've sent me a message, I couldn't see it um, until, yeah, sorry. Uh, okay, so let's try Minecraft Education Edition and see what we got this time. Blah, blah, blah. Yes, I want to open it. <clears throat> it 
explore the beta. Okay. Oh, this just takes me to a thing that shows me. Uh... Okay. So let's just hit okay. And let's say, let me just start play. Uh, let me just create a new world. New creative world type. We'll show my coordinates. We'll do immediate respawn. Activate the cheats. You have to have the cheats activated to have the code builder running. Um, and just so that it's easy to see, we'll make it uh, that. Um, all right, so let's play and see what we got. Hmm? Uh, I just downloaded the Mac version. Yeah. <laughs> Voila, right? Nope. Nope. Uh, well, okay. I, I don't know about if that's the case for the regular version, but this is the educational edition, right? And uh, yeah, okay. So uh, the code builder, right? So if I hit H, right, I've got all this stuff. You guys know, well, how many of you guys have played Minecraft like seriously before? Has anybody not seriously played Minecraft before? Okay, so you guys just hate America or, yeah, um, even though even though Notch, who did this, is he's like from the Netherlands or something, somewhere over in, you know, Europa, Europa Stan. Yeah. Um, anyway, so um, you guys know the controls and whatnot, and I just generated a random world, so, you know, there's a farm village or something going on over there, and um, whatever. Okay. All right, so... One control, though, that's in the educational version that's not going to be in the regular stuff is the code builder. So let's see what we got there. Okay, first thing it's going to ask us to do is um, we can look, we can do things in three different sort of versions of an editor, make code, notebooks, or tinker, okay? Um, they each have a little bit of different stuff. So Microsoft Notebooks is one. This must be new. So I let's see what we've got there. Okay, let's just make a new project and see what's in our code builder. There's a way around that, but we don't need to worry about that at the moment. Um, okay, so what's the downside to this? It's not in block code. It's in Python. Okay, great. All right. Well, let's go back to make code and see if they've added anything to it. Okay, so one of the things that I like about the make code interface is it is block programming. Okay, but you can also do in the same project, look at it in sort of Python or Java script uh, syntax. So for example, let's say that I have a, um, let me just poke around here on chat command on player, do whatever. Okay, the agent is like, uh, you could program like um, basically an imaginary robot, like a little thing that walks around and does stuff for you according to some sort of program. So like, let's say that you had like a little farm and you wanted to automate the watering and tilling of the soil, you could do that with an agent. Um, gameplay position, loops. Okay, logic. Makes sense, variables, math, Let's see what's in advanced. Functions, arrays, text. 
builder. Similarly, there's a thing that can do auto building for you. Shapes and then extensions. There are currently aren't any extensions that I don't think, but oops. Okay. Um, all right. Well, so let's just do something silly here, right? For example, let's say that um, um, let's say that I type the chat command rain. I can use that to trigger something. Okay. So then let me uh, unmaximize un this thing so we can see, run it so that it's now active in the uh, thing. And then if I type T, right? There we go. Then it starts raining. Okay, kind of cool. Uh, and then if I did something like, let me duplicate this. And let me say, then the rain stops. Okay. Um, so it doesn't look uh, like they have added anything to the code builder this view. Um, oops. So let's go back to here, oops, and um, let's look at Tinker and see if they've changed that at all. No, they still haven't added it here. So one of the things that Owen and I were messing with was we wanted there to be, um, so like one of the examples that we saw for a uh, way that you could interface with this, um, but the code's all out of date, so none of it works, was to have, um, uh, you could like program like a Tetris mini game inside Minecraft, right? And that makes sense. Tetris is sort of perfect. It's built out of blocks and so is Minecraft, right? Well, so how do you control playing Tetris? What do you gotta do? You gotta be able to control which direction. So like you need the arrow keys and maybe a button for rotating. Um, and uh, there, is no way in what we have in front of us. Well, okay, I take that back. It might be the case that the Python stuff, the new Python thing has something like that. We'll just have to look at the documentation basically. So there was no way to say, hey, is the right arrow key being pressed? And if so, do something. That's kind of annoying, right? Um, so hopefully they've added this to the... Uh, to the other thing. So let's actually just get out of this and uh, look at Microsoft Notebooks. Um, let's look at one of their examples actually um, and just see what they've got in it. Um, let's add lots of chickens. I'm just going to skip summon, extensions, okay. All right, that's kind of lame. Protect the cake.
Yeah. All right. I'm going to have to read the manuals, dig through the what they've added. Um, OK, so what um, what basically would be the idea if we wanted to program in here? Well, like I said, one obvious thing would be to do something like, um, you know, an auto um, <clears throat> auto farming type script. Uh, you know, to what? What's the what are the food items that are in this thing? Like apples and stuff. Yeah. Very. Huh. Okay. All right. Maybe a sheep sheep herder. Right. Okay. So um, yeah, so you could do something like that. What I was really hoping though was that there'd be a. Um, uh, keyboard commands and ways that you could interface with it because then you could do something cool like um, oh, I don't know build like a, a, a door on a base that you have to solve a puzzle in order for the door to open or something I don't know right uh, or interface with redstone contraptions um, so yeah, since they've added this, and like, what, look, this is literally two days old, so we'll see what uh, what they've put in this uh, version of it, and, and maybe talk about that on Monday. Um, all right, well, why don't, we, um, why don't we actually quit a little early today? Um, the only other thing I wanted to make sure that we're all on the same page with is what, uh, what to do Sunday night. Okay, there's two things. What's the first thing? The scratch project. Okay. How are you going to turn in the scratch project? Yep. All you got to do is give me the link. Okay. However, if you just give me the link, what else do you have to do though? On scratch. You have to actually share or publish the project. Okay. Because otherwise I'll go to the link and it won't let me see it. Right. It's like Google Docs. Um, now, if you do not see a button to publish it, that means you haven't verified your email address. It won't let you publish things until you've done that verification step. Okay, so if you're not seeing it, make sure that you've got your email verified. Um, so yeah, that's all you got to do is give me the link because I'm just going to go to Scratch online, look at your code, run it, you know, see how it works. Uh, okay, so that's thing number one. What's thing number two? Mm -hmm. the core skills exam. Now, if you bomb it, don't worry, because what do you get to do? You get to retake it. Uh, and we'll do basically the next version of it will go live on Wednesday and be due on Sunday the week after, right? And we'll do that four times, okay? And then I'll program Canvas to drop your lowest three. Um, so if you've taken it and you're happy, great. If you bomb it, well, try again. Now, the other thing I did was I made it so that at Sunday, after it's due, it will unlock and show you the correct answers. Okay, but then those will relock uh, before the next exam. So during the early part of the week, what I want you to do is if you got something wrong, look at the correct answer figure out, okay, why did I get this wrong? Did I just misread the question? Do I not understand something? Whatever, right? And if you have questions, then we've got the early part of the week for us to chat and go over, you know, for you to talk with me about something you're not understanding or forgot or whatever, okay? Uh, and then we'll start the whole thing over on Wednesday. Um, okay, sound good? So we'll continue with, uh, hopefully uh, I'll read the manuals and see what's all in this new, new thing, and I guess maybe I'll be teaching you guys a little Python. Um, so, anyway. All right. Have a great weekend. See you uh, Monday.